Hello and welcome to Croflands Community Church and our abridged service online. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope that you will be blessed by spending this time with us today. We'll start off with our reading which is found in Luke 24. Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? and open the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread.
read that the disciples were downcast. And as we saw two weeks ago, for them, things haven't gone as expected. They were confused. They had heard a report that the tomb was empty, which added a new puzzling dimension. The rumour circulating in Jerusalem was that the body had been stolen, while others claimed to have seen him. They had hoped for things to be rather different and clear cut. And in this passage, we see them walking away from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the symbol of the joy of the whole earth, a place for people to come to, not walk away from. People are walking away from our churches, downcast, disappointed and confused. Church attendance is often declining and people's experience of church is not always helpful, sadly. And there is this beautiful moment in the passage that we just read when Jesus himself drew near alongside and joined them on their journey. People were always coming to Jesus, but this time he comes to them and joins them after his resurrection in his incognito self. They don't recognise him. It seems that Jesus is different in some way. Mervyn said last week that Mary didn't recognise Jesus until he spoke her name. And at this point, these two on the road to the village called Emmaus, they don't know who it is that is walking with them. Jesus came alongside them. Let's not just be expecting people to come to us, to come to church. Let's be prepared to ask people, how can I come alongside you in your journey? Are we prepared to come alongside people in their sadness and struggles and be Jesus incognito so that at some point they recognise him in us? These two didn't recognise that it was Jesus. But as they reflected afterwards, they realised that their hearts were burning as he spoke to them. And as we come alongside people on their journey of life, we carry the presence of Jesus. And we have no idea how people's hearts are being impacted as we come alongside. And as Jesus walks with them, he asks them what they're talking about, what they're discussing. And one of them we get his name, he's called Cleopas, asks, are you the only one unaware of the things that have happened in Jerusalem? Are you a visitor? Do you really not know what's been going on? And Jesus says, what things? Now, is Jesus pretending that he doesn't know what's just happened in Jerusalem? Or is he asking the question because he wants them to tell him the story that they are telling themselves? Is he asking the question because he wants them to tell him the story that they are telling themselves? And we get to hear their story. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They are telling themselves a story of disappointment and discouragement. What story are you telling yourself today? I had a conversation with someone this week who is currently telling themselves a deadly story which goes something like this. I'm just a flailing failure. I'm rubbish and I'm not really loved by anyone. A tragic story which that person was speaking into their own lives, a story that they were telling themselves. I repeat, what story are you telling yourself today? This is really important. It's critical because you cannot grow or mature in your faith if you are speaking out the wrong story. Jesus goes on to speak with them and he explains all the scriptures making sense of everything that had to happen and did happen. Now, where is that podcast? I would love to hear it. 
as I'm sure you would too. And Jesus begins to tell them a more beautiful story than the one they are telling themselves. Things in the story that they had missed, explaining how God was working through it all. And maybe there is something in your story that you've missed. You have not realised that everything that has happened to you or been said to you is being worked together for good in God's hands. You find yourself walking away from things that you had hoped for, discouraged and you're missing out on what's really going on in Redemption's story. When we tell the story of the Gospel, we don't always remember to start at the beginning. The story starts in Genesis and it doesn't start with flailing failures who feel like pieces of rubbish, worthless and unloved. It doesn't start with disappointment, discouragement and dirty rotten sinners. In the beginning, when God created us, he speaks well of us. He declares us to be very good and he speaks blessing. He created male and female to be image bearers of himself and God says, very good. It's a story with a great beginning. Before the story of original sin, there is a story of original blessing. But as well as having a great beginning, the story has a glorious ending. So often we downplay this. We say, believe in Jesus and you'll go to heaven. The gospel story says there is hope of new creation, defeat of death and God making all things new. But in the middle of the story is a God who weeps for you, a God who places such value on you and loves you so much that he suffered for you in order to restore you into your rightful place in the story as his child. It's the bit in the middle that needs to be explained. A God who enters your story of disappointment and sadness and places you into a more beautiful story of hope and restoration. A life that overflows as we discover how to truly live. It's the middle part of the story that Jesus is explaining to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, that Jesus had to suffer and rise again. Maybe you've missed part of your story. You are not a flailing failure, a piece of rubbish and not really loved by anyone. You were created in the image of God and God says, very good, valuable, chosen, precious, my delight, the focus of my love. You don't need to be afraid anymore. Maybe you carry the hope of a better life after this one, but you haven't really understood the middle part of the story, that Jesus who explained his part in the story to those disappointed disciples, wants to also make himself known to you through his word. He wants to know you and be known by you as you walk the journey of life together. He is the living word, the living embodiment of whom the words in the book speak. That's why these words can be so powerful and life transforming. Because as we recognise and encounter him, he brings the words to life and plants them in our lives where they heal and reassure us that we are part of this incredible story, that we matter, we are loved, our life has significance. Eternal abundant life is not just a futuristic thing, it starts now because real life that eradicates disappointment, impacts your heart and fills you with worth, value, acceptance, forgiveness, grace, restoration, hope and purpose is not a case of what you know, it's who you know, it's who you hang out with, it's Jesus. Those disciples knew the words on the scroll 
They'd grown up with them. They were ingrained in them as part of their cultural heritage and faith. But it was knowing the one of whom the words speak and personally grasping the middle part of the story that made the difference, that made a beautiful beginning and a glorious ending complete by inserting the incredible middle section. The Bible says, eternal life is knowing you, the one true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Eternal life is knowing you, the one true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Jesus acted as if he would have gone further on his journey, but they invited him into their home to eat with them. And in that meal together, as he broke bread with them and blessed them, they suddenly realised who he was. Maybe you are really familiar with the words in the Bible. You grew up with them. Maybe you've even preached about them. But you are not embedding these words into the story that you are telling yourself about you. Instead of living in what God says about you, you are dragged down and in agreement with what the enemy says about you. Maybe he's spoken it through people, hurtful words and circumstances seem to confirm it. And you've swallowed it all because it feels true. And so instead of living out of a joyful reassurance of who you are in Christ, you unwittingly do what you do because you need to prove something to yourself or to others to show that you are worth something, to be successful in order to mitigate your sense of being a flailing failure. So many people feel this way, and I speak to all of us today. Revelation 3 and verse 20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Why not invite Jesus deep into your life so that you can discover who he really is? When you invite someone to eat with you, as the two disciples did, you invite them into the heart of your home, whatever the mess, regardless of how neat and tidy it is or isn't. But here's a word of warning. When Jesus went into their home, he broke the bread and blessed them. Now that was the job of the host, not the guest. Jesus is the guest who starts to act like the host. They welcomed him and he began to take over. When we invite Jesus into the centre of who we are, he always begins to take over. Because when we welcome the presence of God, we also welcome the power of God to clean us up, to meet the unmet needs, to heal our pain, to set us free from things that negatively control us, to break destructive behaviour patterns, to set our hearts at peace so we're not eaten up by anxiety. He gently helps us to face trauma that is suppressed deep inside and has locked us into a place of depression. He frees us from the gnawing guilt that has dragged us down for years and is starting to affect our health. Jesus says, I will come in and eat with you and we'll sort it out together. As we find our place in his heart, in his family, in the church, in our generation, in our world, we will become increasingly filled and empowered by his presence in our lives. Not only that, we become carriers of his presence as we meet together as his church, but also as we go about our daily lives. The one thing that people desperately need in this crazy world is the presence and the power of Jesus. The one thing they cannot find in the values and toxic messages breathed into a culture that tries to write its own story independently of God is the presence and power of God. A culture that 
writes its own story independently of God is a culture that results in carnage and confusion. If we are walking with Jesus, we are carriers of his presence and power. The transforming ingredients that people are starving for. Let's wake up to the better story. Let's mature into and stand on the truth of who we are in Christ and plug into the voice of God, speaking his blessing and delight over us. Let's come alongside others to demonstrate and share the middle of the story that God suffered in our place to restore us back into relationship with him. Let's live in the hope and security of a glorious ending that is not subject to the curse and doesn't end in the cemetery, but flourishes from glory to glory. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's pray. Lord, reveal yourself to us. Bring your word to life, to us and in us. Awaken us to the glorious story. And instead of walking away sad, like the disciples, may we run back to you. Run back to our place among your people to share the story of glorious transformation and the wonder of our encounter with you. Fill us with your presence so that we might be carriers of your presence. In Jesus' name. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.